Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> There's a wonderful, wonderful lot going on. So I'm going to invite you all to come on in and have a seat. The fellowship is wonderful. <laughs> All right, we're going to go ahead and get started this morning, and uh, as we get going, I have a few announcements to cover. Um, again, want to just say welcome to those of you who are here. We got a lot of chit-chat going on in the back, that's all right. Um, but welcome to those of you who are here, welcome to those of you who are with us on Facebook Live. Um, for those on Facebook Live, I uh, just wanted to say uh, to you that uh, I know the last couple weeks that we have had when uh, the sermon has uh, started the sermon, uh, the audio and video has just been so disruptive that it's, it's not worked at all. So we're trying Facebook Live again today. I'm prayerful, hoping that it works today. Um, if it doesn't work today, I will be pursuing some alternative um, so that you don't keep getting disrupted. So um, anyway, uh, so those of you joining us on Facebook Live, uh, let me know if it doesn't work uh, today and we'll pursue something else. Uh, also this morning, it is May 1st, and so it is a communion Sunday. So if you're here and you haven't gotten your communion stuff yet, um, you can step back and get that or just raise your hand and I'm sure um, one of our greeters will get that to you. Uh, those joining us on Facebook Live, I just want to encourage you uh, right now, if you don't have it already, uh, to grab uh, a cracker and a little cup of juice or some water and some bread, anything to participate in communion with us when we get there. A reminder as well that we do have Sunday school at 9.45 uh, back in the corner classroom. And uh, we are still in Psalm 23. Next week will be verse 5 of 6. And so join us for that. It's been incredible. Uh, men, also, uh, we are having our men's Bible study this Friday, May 6th, from 8 to 9 at the Beecham's home. And this week we will be discussing Matthew chapter 6. Uh, so uh, we have that going on. And men, we'd love to have you join us for that. Prayer meeting is Wednesday at 1.30 in my office here at the church. Uh, so we'd love to have you join us for that as well. Um, and again, just a reminder that the offering is in the back before you leave. Uh, a couple other things that are in your bulletin and one more thing to pass around. But um, this coming Saturday is our highway cleanup. And so we want to encourage you, meet us here at the church at 8 o'clock. We'll get instructions and we'll get all of the supplies and everything. And then we will go and do that. Uh, normally it only takes about two hours if we have enough hands. Uh, if we have a, an abundance of hands, it'll be even less. So uh, please join us for that on Saturday here at 8 o'clock. Um, then the following Saturday, the 14th, is Labor of Love. And so they meet at Pioneer Park at 9 o'clock. Um, and then we'll separate for the ministry projects there. Uh, so mark that on your counters. And two weeks from today, on the 15th, we will have our potluck. And so, again, we want to invite you uh, to join us for the potluck. Um, I have some, a sign-up sheet that I'm going to pass around. So, we have an abundance of turkey. So, turkey is provided. What we are asking you to bring is just uh, like a salad or a side dish or a dessert. Um, something that you can share, uh, you know, uh, with us. But please, please, please. Even if you can't, or for any reason, provide a dish, don't let that keep you away. We always have plenty of food. So don't let this go by and not sign up because you're like, I just can't commit to bringing a dish. I don't know what's going to happen. Sign up. Come. Join us. Don't worry about bringing a dish if you can't bring one. Uh, but join us in two weeks for our potluck. So we'll start that, that way going. Um, oh, and then marking your calendars, even though it's a month away, uh, on June 4th is our church work day. And so that's here at the church uh, from 8 until noon. 
um, and we just want to have you mark your counters. We stay and we work and do things around the church for that day. So uh, please mark your counters for that. Yeah, question. Thank you for the reminder. The National Day of Prayer is this Thursday um, from 12 to 1230 um, at Dame Shirley Plaza. Um, so if you're available, please join us there Thursday, uh, 12 to 1230 for National Day of Prayer. Thank you for that reminder because I had it in my other paper and not with me up here. So um, I think that's all. Uh, and so um, again, it's a joy to be with you. A joy to be with those of you on Facebook Live. And if you would stand now, we will join in worship singing. Good morning. So I get the announcements out of the chronological order. Confused me. <laughs> um, um, this is the day the Lord has made, and we're going to rejoice and a lot in it. So kneel at the cross. It says, kneel at the cross, and Christ will meet us there. And I was thinking about that, and I was thinking, wait a minute, Christ meets me everywhere. He's with me all the time. And then he reminded me it begins at the cross, our relationship with him. this time we come together and we gather to remember what Christ did for us and here at Quincy Community Church we have what is called an open communion and what that simply means is that you do not have to be a member of this church to partake with us in communion. That if you know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you are invited to his table. He says, come. And it's that reminder again, I love this time of spring and the blossoming of the flowers and the
invite you to open your Bibles with me to Luke chapter 7. And we're going to look at verses 1 through 2. And the title of today's sermon as we get started is Just Say the Word. And so follow along with me. Let's read together our passage for today before we pull it apart and examine it together. And so Luke chapter 7, verses 1 through 10. In the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. There, a centurion servant, whom his master valued because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. So Jesus went with them. He was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes. And that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him, and turning to the crowd following Regardless of the terminology, the continent of Australia, for instance, drifts nearly three inches to the northeast every single year. But it is enough of a shift that it has caused problems with the pinpoint accuracy of GPS. Three inches might not sound like a lot of movement, but over the past 16 years since that country's GPS was last updated, Australia has literally moved more than five feet. Now, this began impacting driverless tractors and farmers who depended upon exact coordinates, programming military drones, as well as the mail delivery system. I mean, imagine driving your car and the GPS telling you changing, never shifting, always accurate Word of God. And so this morning, I want to introduce you to a man who was guided in a crisis moment in his life by nothing more than the Word of Christ. 
So again, we're now in chapter 7 of our study through Luke's first letter to Theophilus, a converted Gentile aristocrat. In case you're wondering, Luke's second letter to Theophilus we call the Book of Acts. And Luke tells Theophilus and us there in chapter 7, verse 1, when Jesus had finished saying all of this in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. Now, Capernaum was a busy city built near a major trade route, and it becomes the Lord's home base of ministry. And this summary statement in verse 1 signals a new stage in Jesus' mission and introduces us to a Roman centurion. A centurion was a command of 100 soldiers. A century of soldiers, you could say. And so centurions were responsible for the discipline and the morale of the regiment. They were considered the cement The Greek historian would write 200 years before the birth of Christ the centurions were, quote, reliable men. Gentile officer demonstrating faith. In Jesus Christ. Luke actually introduces us to a number of centurions within his two letters to Theophilus. Let me just quickly summarize. In Luke 23 and in Matthew's parallel account in Matthew 27, the centurion in charge of Jesus' crucifixion declares of Jesus while out on Golgotha, he says, truly, this man was the Son of God. In Acts chapter 10, Luke tells about the conversion of Cornelius, the centurion. Acts 21, a centurion rescues the Apostle Paul from being beaten to death by a mob. In Acts 23, another centurion rescues Paul from an assassination attempt. A centurion accompanies Paul to Rome and treats him with respect and even follows Paul's advice when they are shipwrecked on the island of Malta. And Luke brings at least seven Roman centurions into the gospel narrative and reveals that some of them became followers of Christ. So notice again verse 2. There a centurion servant whom his master value was sick and about to die. Luke, the doctor, gives his prognosis We're told here that the servant was highly valued by the centurion and the word for valued can be translated honored. Or respected. And, and we're not told why, but we are told that the servant's illness was serious enough to the centurion that he enlisted the help of Jewish leaders in the community. Look at verse 3. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. There's an urgency in the centurion's request. And a word for heal here is another medical term that Dr. Luke uses to describe rescuing someone who is about to die from a severe illness. This servant has essentially been rushed into the intensive care unit, you could say. Which is probably why they didn't bring him to Jesus.
That in itself is interesting because the Jewish elders don't typically run errands for people, much less Roman centurions. However, we're told why they do so in verses 4 and 5. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him. This man deserves to have you do this because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. <laughs> they're not just bringing the centurion's request. They're lobbying on his behalf. And, and rightly so. This centurion was evidently a follower of God. Not a full Jewish proselyte, but a God-fearer. He loves the nation Israel. Not many Roman centurions loved Israel. And the word that Luke uses is agapeo. This is the love that comes from a committed mind and heart. He's made up his mind that he loves Israel, which also indicates his love for the God of Israel. This is a unique and a very interesting Roman soldier. We also know from history that the centurion was paid 15 times more than the ordinary soldier, making them wealthy. And evidently this centurion was generous with his wealth. We're told here that he had built one of their synagogues. <laughs> Again, what Roman soldier does that? Well, in the next verse, we're told that Jesus agreed to go with them to the home of the centurion. Again, in, in Matthew's parallel account, he reports Jesus as saying, I will go and heal him. Now, keep that in mind. Jesus doesn't say, I'll, I'll go and I'll take a look and see if there's anything I can do. No. He says, I'll have you come under my roof. Let's stop there for a moment. Don't read ahead. Let's stop there for a moment. Because I want to point out two terms that the centurion delivers to Jesus here. First, he uses the term Lord. And as I shared in last week's message, this can be an expression of honor, like saying sir or ma'am to someone out of respect. However, most often in these New Testament encounters, believers called Jesus Lord because they knew who he was. Unbelievers most often called him teacher or rabbi. And somewhere during this time, the centurion has been doing his homework, and God grants to this Roman soldier the very insight about the Jewish nation or about God, that the Jewish nation is having a hard time getting their minds around. And based upon his faith and the word of Christ alone, this centurion is not referring to Jesus as sir, but as the divine Lord. It's interesting to note that Notice again in verse 6, he sends a message to Jesus that says, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. Now there's actually a play on words here between the Jewish elders and this Roman soldier. 
In verse 4, the elders tell Jesus, you have to help him. He deserves it. But the centurion says, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. He is essentially saying, since you are the Messiah, the anointed incarnation of Jehovah, you don't have to bother taking the time to even come to my home. You don't have to visit the ICU. You don't even have to be in the neighborhood. And then verse 7. Just say the word, Lord. Just say the word and my servant will be healed. Well, the centurion goes on to explain in verse 8. For I myself am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes. idea of I say do it and they snap to it and they do it. The centurion is saying to Jesus, look, I am a military man and I have authority over my 100. When I tell my men to march, they don't say, eh, let me think about it or, uh, but my feet hurt. No, they march. And when I tell them to do something, they say, yes sir. <laughs> what the centurion is saying to Jesus is this Lord I command anything under my authority and so can you and since you're the Lord of the universe everything is under your authority my paralyzed servant disease the power to heal time and distance the world everything is under your command Lord just Say the word. I got to wondering as, as I read this, how responsive are we? Because God said so in his word. I think we all, and I'm including myself in this, when I say we, I'm pointing more fingers at me than anyone else. I think we need to adopt the attitude that we see in this centurion. The attitude of Lord, just say the word. Well now look at verse 9. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. The Jewish elders commended this man's works. Jesus commended this man's faith. And his faith was placed not in his own works, but in the words of Jesus. Jesus, just say the word.
miraculously, immediately he is healed and in good health. Not just, oh, I, I, I feel a little better. He's in good health. This is one of those instances, again, where you could say multiple miracles happen. We hear the mir miracle of healing, but it was so much more than just that. You know, oh, I feel a little better. It was, he's now in good health. I'll tell you what, I go without a meal. And I'm like, oh, you know? <laughs> Let alone all of these things. And then we're told that he was well, in good health. Jesus just says the word. Again, it made me think about what we depend on as believers each day of our lives. Are we depending simply on the word of the Lord? And he doesn't even have to be in the room where we can see him or, or hear him to believe him. In fact, J.C. Ryle provoked my thinking when he wrote this expository thought on this text more than a hundred years ago. He asked the question, have you actually seen the book of life? Have you seen, physically seen, your name written in there? No? Then how do you know it's in there? Because the word of God says that believers in the gospel are those whose names are written in the book of life. Philippians 4, 3. J.C. Ryle goes on, have you actually heard Jesus standing in as your advocate before the Father, defending you? Because Jesus said in John 14, 2, I go to prepare a place for you, and I will come again. Where I am, there you will be also. But between here and heaven, how do you know that Jesus won't change his mind and abandon you? Because he said in Matthew 28, 20, Look, I am with you always even until the end of time. His word, his word says so. David Livingston, the pioneer missionary to Africa in the 1800s, said that in every crisis of life, he would go back to Matthew 28, 20, and he would write in his journal, this promise is the word of a gentleman of the highest order. He has given us his word. We are living in a day of uncertainty. It's like the GPS for life has gotten scrambled. We're living in an age where people The question is, where will they look to find the truth? Whose advice will they take? Whose words will they follow? And I overheard the clerk say to her, I hope you're having a good day. And this girl responded, well, not really. My foot is hurting. <laughs> well, she went on, actually, to tell the whole story. It wasn't a super long story, but she told the whole story about how she had been hurt in the soccer game and that it had ruined her hopes of ever being a dancer. 
Well, uh, another woman who was nearby and listening, and, and obviously knew this girl, said to her, You know, God has a reason for everything, even though we might not understand it. And the teenager looked at her and said, Oh, I know that, because this injury has given me a lot of time to focus on my religion. And so this woman got a little excited, and she said, she replied, Well, there you go. What religion are you? And the girl answered, Oh, I'm a pagan. Now, I, I admit, I was not expecting that one, and so I kind of perked up because I was wanting to hear a little more. And uh, neither was the woman apparently expecting that either. And she said with some clear surprise in her voice, uh, You're a pagan? Uh, I know some people that fit that description, and, but tell me what that means to you. Well, the teenager answered, Well, I'm studying Wicca, and I want to become a witch. The woman then replied, Well, that's interesting. Uh, what are you going to do with that? The life doing all these things, let me ask you something. What are you going to do a couple minutes after you die? And the teen girl hemmed and hawed, and then finally said, well, I hope the divine will be good to me. Well, the woman quickly grabbed a hold of that comment and stated, so you do believe there is a God after all. And a bit taken aback, the teenager replied, well, well no, not, not like that. With that, the conversation ended as another customer stepped up to the counter. And it got me thinking, like the rest of the world around her, this girl's foundation is built on shaky ground. For her, it's, it's, it's all about the earth. And I couldn't help but think, even the earth isn't stable. The continents are shifting, drifting. No help to GPS and no help in providing directions that can last a lifetime, let alone beyond a lifetime here. Where is the word, the counsel, the advice for life that is solid and true and eternal? Well, from Scripture. And listen to this. In closing, from Psalm 33. For the word of the Lord is upright, and all his work is done in faithfulness. By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth all their host. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke, and it came to be. He commanded, and it stood firm. The Lord brings the advice of the nations to nothing, but the advice, the word of the Lord, stands forever. Amen.
And now receive today's benediction, which comes from Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly, think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen.